everyone. My name is Oya Demirbilek and I'm a professor of industrial design at UNSW. And on behalf of the industrial design program, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all joining us today. I welcome you from the beautiful Bijikul country where I live and acknowledge the Bijikul people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, both past and present and extend that respect to all other indigenous peoples joining us today. So when I checked this morning, we had 278 attendees in LinkedIn and many from overseas. So we are very excited about that. So welcome and thank you for joining us for the second talk on stories behind products. We are expecting these talks to be quite fluid. Um, just my slide is not working, there we go. So the audience can ask the questions via the chat function and we will answer most of them at the end. So three weeks ago, we launched the talk series, Stories Behind Products, to celebrate the 30 plus years of the industrial design program at UNSW. And today we are proud to have Ross Nichols, an industrial designer living in Australia. So welcome, Ross. Uh, Ross is an industrial design honors graduate from UNSW. And before studying with us as a mature student, uh, Ross actually studied and worked as a graphic designer. And however, as at some stage in his life, he felt that this lacked a sense of engagement in materials, manufacturing processes, and a physical interaction with a product. So he decided to change careers and became an industrial designer. And he did well. Uh, Ross also taught as a tutor in industrial design, and he also worked for a coffee roasting company to learn more about coffee business. Uh, from an insider's perspective, because Ross loves coffee. And during his time uh, with the coffee roaster, the idea of the juggler coffee milk tap system was born. And together with two other UNSW graduates, Ross started the Six Simple Machines Company to design and commercialize the system for the juggler. So Ross will talk more about the details shortly. But I wanted to show you an image where we have Ross. And there we go. You remember that one, Ross? Mm -hmm. So here you see Ross with two of his classmates, Doug Nash and Oyston Lee. And together, they won the first prize for the Electrolux Design Laboratory Competition in New York. And that was in 2004. They submitted this project as part of their third year studio project. They designed a waterless dishwasher called Rockpool. Uh, so it's a washing system that uses pressurized carbon dioxide. And they had discovered that uh, this process creates a supercritical fluid that acts as a powerful solvent cutting through the grease on plates and cutlery. So I, I want that um, thing in my kitchen right now. So Ross, I will hand over to you now. All right. I should unshare. Thanks. There we go. That's fantastic. Look, uh, I think you pretty much covered it. Um, so my job's done. <laughs> but in case you've missed anything, uh, let's get on to, on to this. Okay, so can everyone see that? The, uh, the PowerPoint presentation I've pulled up there? So yes. great. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I've put together a bit of a PowerPoint presentation to run through to sort of keep me a little bit on track. Um, haven't really rehearsed uh, what I'm going to sort of talk about. So I'm just going to let the slides sort of prompt me, I guess, um, and see, see sort of how we go. Um, but as, uh, as, as, as Oya uh, says, um, I said rather, we're, uh, we're a small business um, based in Botany, uh, Australia. Uh, business we, call, we call ourselves Six Simple Machines. Um, we manufacture, uh, design, manufacture, um, install, uh, service, sell um, uh, dispensing machines for uh, cafes uh, and other hospitality type businesses, uh, other food service type businesses. The product we're going to talk about today um, is really the first product that we, that we ever designed um, and a product we still uh, produce today uh, and sell. 
uh, to Australian businesses, New Zealand businesses, uh, businesses overseas in Asia, UAE, Europe, um, UK, um, America. Our main business is still here in Australia, but we, we do sell into um, other, other markets as well. So I thought I'd start the, the, um, the talk I've sort of divided into three kind of areas. We're just gonna sort of talk a little bit about the juggler, just so that you kind of know what we're talking about um, as a product. Um, gonna then sort of just talk briefly a little bit about my journey, I suppose, up to university, what got me to university, why I studied uh, what I did. Um, as Oya mentioned, I'm a, I started university as a mature age student. Um, and so the decision making sort of there was, was led by a bunch of stuff. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that, but I think it's, it's sort of important because it sort of frames some of the, uh, the decisions that really led to, um, you know, the decision to create the juggler as a product too uh, and the way we run our business. Now, the juggler um, is a milk tap system. Uh, we call it a milk tap system. Um, it's a set of taps that uh, dispense milk. Uh, for um, uh, use in cafes alongside traditional espresso-based coffee machines. Um, we, we produce a number of different versions uh, with different amounts of taps, different things going on inside the refrigerators, uh, different refrigerator sizes and so on, all to sort of um, uh, fit different business needs, I guess. Um, I've just got a little one minute video that I hope is gonna play right now. Um, and it's going to, um, I'll just talk as it goes. It'll just, again, sort of show you what the system does. So the system doesn't use milk in bottles for a start. It, use milk, it uses milk in bags. Uh, in this case, they're 10 litre bags. They are put inside the system like that, inside the refrigerator, um, and then they dispense cold milk into jugs. Um, the overall sort of user interface is a very intuitive thing that we came up with. Um, little sensor there recognizes the jugs rather than pressing buttons. There's a certain action that you can do there to fill jugs to different heights um, and also use it um, you know, manually without just setting, using the preset doses. Um, there's a little integrated jug rinser there to keep the, uh, the jugs clean. Um, there's an automated line cleaning system, a CIP system, cleaning in place system that ensures the, the machine itself is uh, kept clean um, at the end of service. So that in short is what, the, is what the juggler is. As you see, a bunch of taps that uh, dispense milk. Um, the reason for businesses to use the, the, the machine um, really sort of boiled down roughly to three sort of categories to increase productivity. Of course, all businesses don't mind that. To reduce waste. Uh, both milk waste uh, and also packaging waste, uh, specifically plastic, um, and also improve the quality of, of uh, the coffee being, being produced, uh, milk-based coffee is being produced. So just if we unpick just one of those, let's just talk about reduce waste for a moment. Uh, prior to the juggler um, existing, the only uh, you know, practical source for milk in cafes uh, were two litre bottles, three litre bottles, um, whatever other milk bottles are in other markets uh, as well. So um, that was really the only uh, packaging available to, to um, uh, cafes. Um, what we did was, was uh, sort of look at, look at alternate sort of packaging. Um, and now that the juggler sort of exists on the market, um, you know, cafe owners have the, uh, the choice basically to still buy their milk in, in um, uh, bottles and not use our system um, or use uh, milk in uh, this alternate packaging format called bag in box. Uh, bag in box is a, um, um, a, a sort of well-known existing uh, packaging uh, format. I'll perhaps touch on that a little bit later. But the thing to sort of know here is that for those five two-litre milk bottles uh, that hold 10 litres of milk, there's about the same amount of plastic in one of those as there is in the 10-litre bag there uh, on the other side of the screen. Um, so for the same volume of milk, in this case, 10 litres, 
um, there's about an 80% reduction um, in the amount of plastic being used to um, you know, package that, that product. Now, I'll just remind you, I guess, that this was a, um, a, a project and a product that we started um, about 10 years ago, actually. So um, these decisions were sort of based on, on, you know, basically what we were thinking was going on in the world 10 years ago, uh, and they're still, still quite valid today. Um, so not only is it 80% uh, less plastic, um, you just sort of think about the, the physical volume that that sort of um, uh, um, you know, occupies in the, in the waste stream. So yes, milk bottles are recyclable, um, but I'm pretty sure everyone can probably agree that recycling is, uh, is out of hand. It's not, not the answer. In fact, I think it's you know, further down the uh, uh, sort of the hierarchy of, of nice to haves. There was once, you know, reduce, re uh, reuse, recycle. I'm pretty sure recycle has now sort of slid, uh, slid down further um, in terms of, uh, you know, desirable outcomes, you know, getting rid of plastic or packaging, you know, at the source um, has always been, you know, by far and away a better, a better choice. So that's, that's what we really tried to do with the juggler. Um, and you can see there uh, just a little image that shows roughly one week's worth of um, uh, waste in milk bottles stuffed in those bags versus um, the same amount of milk in the plastic uh, bags or the bag in box, um, the juggler bags that we call them, um, there in, in the green bag. And that's about a, um, roughly about a, um, a, a very, um, like a successful cafe, but it's not a super pumping cafe, certainly not a sort of quiet cafe, but you know, you, you're pretty average sort of suburban cafe. Every, every week they're producing about that amount of, that amount of waste. Um, we've calculated over the time um, that uh, the juggler has been around um, that we've saved, you know, more than about 55 million uh, two-litre two uh, bottles worth of, worth of plastic. Um, we know this because we roughly know what our customers use, um, even on an ongoing basis. Uh, and also we work closely with the, the packaging producers, so we know how much, how many they're, they're producing, uh, and therefore we can sort of you know, unpick that and turn that into a rough number that we think we've sort of saved over the years. Um, but I thought I'd use a really cheesy um, transition here because it's not really a talk about the juggler. Um, it's talk about the stories behind the juggler. So um, those early slides, I suppose, showed you a bit of an idea of, of perhaps what the business has become. The factory here is a nice factory, beautiful place to come to work. Um, it's a big place. We've got lots of things going on that are, you know, I find quite interesting and fun. Um, and also the environment here itself is really nice, but uh, that was not always the way. We'll get there. Um, so just quickly, what led me um, to, um, uh, you know, to my, I suppose, experience at university um, and, uh, you know, and eventually sort of the juggler. So I'm just going to go quickly through this. It's not a story about me, but again, it's, uh, it's, it, I think it's relevant. So I grew up in a small coastal town at the time called Avoca Beach. Uh, it's a bit different now than when I grew up, but at the time it was a small coastal town. About the only thing I was interested in was uh, going surfing. I um, did pretty bad at school as a result. Uh, in fact, my final um, exam sort of period, I remember calling a friend and saying, hey, surf's good, let's go for a surf. He said, oh, dude, you know, it's the maths test today. Um, so um, that sort of perhaps gives you a bit of an idea that I was not a good student uh, and I didn't really <laughs> have a very good outcome from school. Um, from there, when school finished, um, family moved to Perth um, and I, I followed because uh, really I was still um, completely sort of uh, lost about what I was going to do, but I was pretty good drawer, uh, pretty good at painting and so on, and fell into studying graphic design, as Oya um, mentioned. Um, that actually sort of, uh, you know, sort of represented a little bit here as well. These were the first business cards that, that we produced here. And, and, and one of the things that, that I found with graphic design was, you know, I was really stagnating, I guess, with the, with the idea of producing uh, stuff. I was 
I was doing a lot of wine labels and things like that. And I was really interested in the process, the printing processes and so on, far more than actually the printed material that was being, um, uh, being, being sort of designed and, and, and done. As I started to become a little bit disillusioned with uh, my, my choice in life, um, a colleague and a, and a friend of mine just happened to show me this uh, kind of cool thing that he had. Um, I had already developed a bit of a love of coffee um, and he showed me the atomic coffee maker. And oh, cool, you know, what is, what is that? What sort of person, uh, you know, designs these things? Um, so, you know, it came to be with a bit of, bit of uh, research or whatever, you know, an industrial designer, you know, they're the sorts of people that uh, then create these things. You, know, you can have your craftspeople, you can have your engineers, you know, or somewhere sort of, you know, between perhaps as, a, as an industrial designer, sort of bridging, perhaps bridging that gap. So, so the moment that, that I was, I was sh sort of shown this little machine um, as, you know, perhaps small and insignificant as it is, it really made a big impact on me. It's like, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to become a person that can do stuff like that. About the same time, though, uh, because I was working, you know, on a lot of uh, wine labels, uh, a lot of our customers were down in um, Margaret River, um, in the Margaret River region, um, where a lot of vineyards are. Um, I was really drawn to the area um, because the livestock and the surf, so I moved down there um, and spent uh, a fair bit of time down there. Um, I was working on a vineyard, uh, living on a dairy farm. So again, hold on to that thought. Um, but I wasn't really getting anywhere much in life. Uh, working for pretty much minimum wages. Um, and it sort of came back to me that, oh, come on, you know, you've got this idea that you want to be an uh, industrial designer. Um, you know, give it a bit, of a bit of a shake and do something about it. So I was lucky to be, um, uh, you know, accepted into the UNSW uh, ID program as a mature age student. I was 28 at the time. Um, so I was that old, kind of weird guy that kind of didn't really have any friends at uni. Uh, but I really enjoyed, um, you know, being there. And I was sort of there to, I was there to learn. You know, I'd already sort of worked out kind of how many of the things work in life. And uh, I was there to sort of, sort of learn. And, and, and so I threw myself into, um, into the course. Uh, and um, yeah, had a, had a pretty interesting time. Um, why did I choose UNSW? It was the closest uni to the beach, and that was all that, uh, that was about the only reason. Um, I figured that uh, the timetable was that you weren't in classes all the time, but you know, there'd be dead time. And of course, um, I did what I could, which was jump in the car and surf and surf. Um, so that was why I picked you. SW. Um, so all along, perhaps you can see a bit of a theme here that, uh, that you know, um, I guess I'm sort of a, uh, a bit more of a, uh, you know, drifter, I guess, through things. Again, someone who's sort of sticking to a rigid life plan. Um, at uni, I met two people uh, that become very, uh, very significant in my life. Um, Adam Preston, who was studying mechatronics engineering, um, and Greg Scott, who um, we're studying industrial design uh, with me. Um, Adam uh, eventually finished uni, uh, worked for a few sort of spots, ended up uh, working at Breville, um, designing coffee machines. Uh, Greg uh, did a few sort of things from uni um, and I suppose perhaps most significantly uh, worked for um, Surf Hardware International or SES um, in you know, high volume um, manufacture, design and manufacture for the surf industry. During that time, I was still a um, bit of a bum, uh, just designing some nice sort of things, uh, trying to work out basically kind of how to, how to start a business, what the toehold is going to be. Um, so I designed a bunch of nice things and I think uh, won some awards and all of that, but there was a sort of feeling like, you know, take chairs, for example, am I going to sort of spend my time designing nice things for rich people to put their buns on? So I thought there was something more to life than that. So um, re-enter the coffee machine idea. So this was a little working prototype of the first um, effort, I guess, at uh, 
it's sort of a business idea. This was a, um, this came about the story of that is a funny story, which I'll spare you. Um, but this is a little prototype of a machine that was based on my final year um, uh, university project. Uh, and it's a little stovetop coffee machine um, that can make coffee as good as, you know, a proper commercial um, uh, espresso machine in a cafe. It sounds a bit far-fetched, but it's true. Um, more than that, it actually, all the little sort of dials there and stuff, they do things to the coffee, uh, let you control the extraction in such a way that really lets you um, have sort of full control over this, this, um, this espresso extraction. So something completely uh, ridiculous, but I kind of like that. Um, so I, I, I sort of felt um, through this period, actually, um, Adam and I were, were, were sort of you know, looking at this together and, and he helped uh, with some, some CAD uh, to make some of the parts and so on. And uh, we sort of thought, wow, this is, this, is, this is the business. We're gonna make coffee machines. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna commercialize this. But both of us, uh, despite the fact that he was already making coffee machines for Breville, um, we realized we didn't really know enough about the coffee industry, feeling that it was important to How much of that did you miss? So anyway, look, I'll go back. I'll just sort of talk about this. Um, the, the coffee machine ideas sort of came, came about, um, but we realized we didn't really know much about the, uh, the industry, um, uh, the coffee industry. So um, I got a job with a small um, coffee roasting company. At the time they were called Single Origin Roasters um, and they rebranded. And they became, and they are today, a company called Single O. So from that experience, I learned a fair bit about the coffee industry from, you know, um, I suppose an insider's perspective. Um, and through that experience, um, I worked with um, the chap there, the furthest to the left on screen in the white shirt, a chap called Nick Smith, to design this tiny little eight square metre hole in the wall cafe. Um, a bunch of sort of stuff around that that was, it was really, really quite a cool process and a very well received little, um, tiny little cafe. But one of the main things with it, we knew that there was no back door to this thing. The only sort of, you know, uh, entry and exit point there was the little gap between the, um, uh, the benches. Uh, and so they expected to be using about 80 litres of milk a day. And we thought, far out, we can't have people coming and going with those plastic bags of bottles. So um, we came up with this idea of um, uh, a little milk tap system. So um, I set about and designed that little thing. Again, enlisted Adam's help with um, a bit of the electronics and we made a little milk on tap system. So if you look into that little photo of the cafe, you'll see a little stainless steel pipe uh, and that's kind of our first machine. So at that stage, we, there, there weren't you know, maybe a few people had tried putting milk through beer taps and things like that, but there wasn't really practical milk dispensers designed specifically for busy cafes. Um, we we're lucky at the time, uh, Single Origin uh, Roasters, now Single O, uh, were working closely with um, John Fairley there, who owns Country Valley Milk, um, and he agreed to supply milk in uh, 20 litre bins or um, buckets uh, that, the, that the machine sort of fed from. At the same time, um, someone gave me a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. It's uh, one of probably three books I've read in my entire life uh, and the only business book that I've ever read. Um, and it talked about a, um, a concept where, you know, starting a business, don't look in the red ocean. That's, a, that's uh, an area of business populated by, you know, um, uh, it's highly contested, lots of, lots of uh, competition. And certainly coffee machines were that. There was a lot of, lot of coffee machines in the market. And so, you know, the book sort of goes on to say that that's blood in the water and all of that. So look, look somewhere else, look, look to the side um, and look for a blue ocean where there's no blood in the water, that there's no competition, identify uh, a need and, you know, work towards fulfilling that need. Uh, that resonated because that was sort of a bit of a mantra through university that we 
has really drilled into us, identify an unmet need. Um, and, and so the two kind of, you know, it's a bit, again, a bit of a light bulb moment. And it's like, wow, it's not the coffee machine. It's milk on tap. Let's do milk on tap. So that then, you know, flooded back all the experience there on the vineyard so, and, the, and the love of agriculture that I kind of uh, uh, developed uh, time on the dairy farm, which I really, really enjoyed um, seeing, I suppose, you know, getting a, getting a first-hand impression, I suppose, or appreciation of the work that dairy farmers do to bring their milk um, to, you know, to the table, to, to uh, the shops. It was just sort of extraordinary. So that kind of you know, all sort of pointed towards this, this little moment where it was like, yep, yeah, milk on tap. That's going to be, you know, what you're going to do for the next little time. So back to the cheesy uh, transition. This is where we started. Um, very different to now, um, but our little first factory was actually a horrid little place um, and it even looks horrid uh, with a wide angle lens and that's where we spent um, a lot of time Adam and I we um, just we machined things we designed things we just tested 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 you know all of this stuff you know so 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 much um, and eventually we ended up with something that sort of started to become you know what we what we eventually called the juggler. So in that time, um, you can sort of see that it's, it's not a very glamorous kind of um, time, but, but a lot was going on there. Um, we didn't have you know, much money. We didn't have a lot of resources to, to do things, but we worked really hard at, at designing this thing, designing the electronics, designing all the components. But most of all, sort of um, conceptualizing what a bulk milk dispenser could be for cafes. Because again, before the juggler, again, there might've been a couple of uh, milk uh, dispensers that were beer dispensers. Um, but apart from that, you know, there was nothing designed uh, for the cafe in this, this type of format. So we were, we were really, you know, deciding what packaging format, you know, and so we looked at, at kegs, we looked at all sorts of different things and, and eventually, as we got to know the dairy industry and producers, we really felt that we had to use something that was um, known already. Um, and that's why we settled on the, the bag in box. So a little bit more about that in a second. I'll just bring your, um, I suppose, attention to these three um, little things. Unfortunately, yes, we go here. So during that time, again, these look really rough. Uh, pretty um, fundamental, I suppose, to the way we were working at the time. Um, we were working in the real world, not in CAD world. You know, yeah, we spent a lot of time, you know, in on the computer in CAD and so on. But you know, that you can do all simulation sort of stuff you like. But when when you're actually making physical working prototypes, you start to learn a lot about um, about the um, uh, you know, what you're dealing with, I suppose, the realities of what you're dealing with. So, um, you know, designing the first little activator there, coming up with that, you know, what's it going to be? Is it going to be buttons? Is it going to be, you know, holograms? Is it going to be whatever, you know, activate this? So we, we invented this little sensor um, that could recognise the jug size. Um, we could have used all, you know, various technologies out there, but we had enough understanding at that point. The cafes weren't you know, lovely, pristine places. They were dirty, they were wet, they were greasy, they were messy, um, and there was no changing that. So we came up with this design for a, for a little sensor there that um, recognises the jugs, um, all the different jug sizes commonly being used, um, enables, you know, a bunch of other um, actions to be, to be used so that the barista can, can um, ultimately get the, the amount of milk that they like and they want. Um, and so we set about sort of designing that, um, conceptualizing that, turning it into a product. Part of turning it into a product is something that um, uh, making something that works at the same time, so yeah, you can do that. But um, this was probably our first little um, test rig that we built to test that sensor um, and for all the things, you know, was the, 
were the arms going to sort of slowly change shape? Was the sensor going to sort of, you know, um, you know, stop working for whatever reason? Um, and through that, that, that set a bit of a, um, we worked out how many cycles we felt the machine should sort of probably do in its expected life time. And that's probably about, you know, half a million cycles. And so we thought, fuck it, let's double it. Um, and so nowadays, and including this thing, um, our rough um, goal there for any life test rig that we do is at least a million cycles. Um, and, and so even <laughs> horrible testing, um, we still made this, this little rig there um, that, that proved to us what to expect over time with this with these parts. Um, we found um, through that process, you know, we had a few sort of parts change shape and I suppose the, the thinking that we, um, that we do at Revel. Um, what's more, we thought we had a good idea. Uh, we knew we had a good idea because of even the um, the response to that first little one um, that I showed you in the in the early uh, single origin roasters cafe. Uh, but we didn't really know we had a sort of a, a, a marketable good business idea. Milk, you know, is, is, is an early product. It, it spoils. It, it's, it's really, really wild. Uh, and so we looked into um, certifications. We found that we, you know, there were a bunch of electrical safety certifications and stuff that we needed on the product to go to market with legally. Um, and that was all kind of easy. Um, but there was no, weirdly, there was no food safety stuff that we absolutely had to um, comply to, which seems really weird. Uh, again, milk is, you know, it's a, it's a, a very, it's, it's classified as a high risk um, fluid, uh, again, because of the, you know, the, the health outcomes if, if things go bad. Um, so we engaged with um, a, a, uh, an organization called HACCP International. Um, HACCP started, um, in the US to make sure the early space missions uh, didn't fall foul to um, dodgy food. So it was a, um, you know, started off uh, as, a, as an organization looking at, you know, food processing and making sure every, you know, critical control point was, um, uh, you know, not likely to sort of bring any hazards. They extended their offer uh, to certification on products. Uh, and so we engaged them to really sort of look at our product. Um, we did a lot of um, uh, testing at this stage, microbiological testing on the product. We worked with the company to develop a, um, uh, a cleaning chemical, um, a six monthly deep clean process. Um, and you know, submitted all this to HACCP, uh, who eventually uh, said, wow, well, you guys have actually designed something we thought shouldn't actually exist. Um, and you know, we, we endorse your product being a food safe product. So I think that was the point that we sort of thought, wow, okay, we, we actually have a business, you know, not just a product that's kind of cool, but this is sort of something that's gonna, gonna work and not make people sick. Um, it, was, it was a pretty intense time. Um, Adam uh, uh, reminded me that during that time we'd worked for 100 days straight uh, from, you know, probably about six, you know, seven in the morning to probably 10 at night, 100 days straight, no weekends, just intense on this, you know, it was just like this, this all or nothing kind of pro project. Eventually had, had a Sunday off um, and I actually remember that and how wonderful that was. Uh, Monday, went back to work and we did about 80 more straight before we started to, you know, get somewhere and feel that we started to have a, have a product that we could go to market with. So I guess from that, you know, you could sort of see that that, you know, coming up with the product and going through that whole 
process is, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to it and, and we really, really threw ourselves into it. Eventually, we had something that started to look a bit like the juggler. Um, so this was, you know, just a rendering of the very first model that we did um, that we eventually went down to single origin with, took out the first one and installed it for life testing. So we'd done a lot of simulated life testing, but now we needed to do field trial, you know, stuff in a cafe before we felt we could really start asking for money for these things. Um, we weren't quite ready, even though it was a pretty busy cafe and a well-known cafe at the time to show it. So we built a box, put some dirt on the top, uh, put a cow there, put some uh, grass seed in there um, and figured when that grass was up to about the, uh, the cow's belly, um, that we'd call the, uh, the trial a success or fail. So um, fortunately, the trial was a success. Uh, and we felt like we had a product. Uh, but we also knew that we, we, we weren't just about sort of, you know, a new product. Um, we were introducing to the market a new product category, a milk dispenser, a bulk milk dispenser that's practical for cafes, um, that uses, you know, bag in box milk, packaged milk in a certain way um, that, again, was, was, was practical. Um, we also were a new brand, no one knew who we were. Um, and so that really sort of formed the, the way we, I suppose, started to do business. Um, the milk packaging that I met that I mentioned uh, before, uh, bag in box. So there were there was bag in box milk before, uh, but we um, uh, chose a certain uh, cap, which meant that anyone packaging milk for the juggler needed to change their process, the packaging process, to accept that um, uh, style, I guess, of, of bag in box packaging. So um, we got heavily involved with um, the dairy industry at this point, uh, that is individual companies, um, and this wonderfully um, uh, photo there, very, very nice photo of us uh, in the middle. Um, you know, it's pretty, pretty representative of that time. We were spending a lot of time in, in dairy um, factories, you know, in processing plants. Uh, that little milk filling machine on the uh, left of screen, that was uh, one that John Fairley bought once we showed him, you know, the, the, the concept for the bag in box. It was like, wow, this is great, you know, and he, and he went out and bought himself a little milk filler in order to fill bags for the juggler. So without his decision to do that, we wouldn't have started, uh, we wouldn't have got a toehold in, I suppose, on, on having product available for our customers. Um, from there, uh, we became our own salespeople. Um, there's uh, Charles on the far left, one of our very, very, very early customers, a uh, very dear friend um, and a very enthusiastic customer. But because of, again, you know, a new business, we really wanted to control the outcome, the experience people were having with our product. Um, so we became the install, you know, not just the manufacturer installers, we became the product trainers um, and also our own service agents. So all of this was done by Adam and myself in the first years of, of putting the, uh, the juggler out. Uh, eventually Greg joined us, uh, Greg Scott, who I mentioned before, um, and the three of us continue to work here um, in the office today. Um, you know, and today the, the juggler is still produced. We, we, you know, our processes are very, very, very different now. Our, our, um, our factory is very different. Uh, the amount of products we're producing, you know, obviously much more, we've learned so much. Uh, and we're applying a lot of those lessons to, you know, other products that we're, that we're putting into the market. Um, but that's sort of not the end of the story. Um, the, the, the juggler over the time has evolved. Um, we've not just designed a, a product 10 years ago and then sat around sort of watching people make it for us. Um, things happen along the way. You want to change things. Things don't work. You want, to, you want them to be better. You notice things about the product that really aren't working out so well. So with a business like ours, there's always design work. You know, it's... Um, you know, and this shows sort of three evolutions of the juggler that more or less sort of look the same, but there's a lot of, a lot of work in between each one of these variations of the machine and all the sort of subcategories that kind of fit in between there. 
Um, but, you know, our, our business um, today is still sort of based on the same sort of, I suppose, fundamentals that, that we've always um, applied. Uh, and one of the things that was very successful about the juggler was that decision not to sort of use buttons, not to use, you know, infrared sensors that don't quite work or, or, or you know, induction switches or whatever, you know, we came up with this lovely little um, uh, jug size sensor um, to use the product. It gave the, the user a, a really nice sort of uh, tactile feedback. They can use it with muscle memory, you know, and the feedback machine tells them that they got it right, you know, and they don't even have to look. And so watching someone that uses the machine and is engaging with that, that sensor really well, you know, it's actually quite you know, again, quite gratifying to sort of to sort of see. Um, so that's still still very much part of, of the way we look at things. You know, there's never just oh, we'll just put a button on that and and you know call it sort of solved. We're we're constantly trying to um, really get to the kernel, I suppose, of what people uh, are interested or you know uh, the solution, I guess. Um, uh, you know, in a, in a in a creative or perhaps a more sort of engaged sort of level. Um, engineering rigor has always been something we, we've, you know, applied to what we've we've done even back in those early days in that horrid first workshop. Uh, we still try to do things right, you know, and a lot of that really came from Adam's experience at Breville uh, and then later Greg's experience with um, FCS. So, you know, whether it be, you know, life testing of, of sort of stuff, we've got a life test down there going, I can hear in the background of something. Um, or, you know, um, FEA sort of stuff on, on you know, on components uh, on the computer. We, we really, really try hard to make sure that, you know, our brand, I suppose, is protected the best way that we can, and that's by making stuff as we feel, as good as it needs to be. Um, meticulous process, that's the other sort of thing. We don't cut corners. So um, if there's, you know, a... Um, uh, you know, standard to uh, apply or, a, um, um, you know, something that we need to, uh, you know, sort of compliance sort of, um, uh, sort of rules that we need to apply to, we get, we get into that, you know, the early stage with, with design. Very easy to go through something, get it on the market, know you're not really doing the right thing, but sell them and no one really knows, you know, until there's a problem. We've always had a bit of a different sort of slant on that uh, because our customers, you know, individual cafes, well, you know, they, they probably don't sort of know or care too much about that, um, about the compliance side of things. But when you're starting to work with bigger companies that we do with, um, you know, international companies, um, they, they have, uh, you know, people who are all about quality assurance, you know, and, and the first thing they ask is, you know, in America, does it have, you know, NSF, you know, in Europe, does it have, you know, the cup and fork or CE and, and all of that? And if you, if you can't answer those from the outset, well, you sort of dead straight away. So, um, so yeah, we continue to apply that you know, meticulous process, I suppose, to, to, um, to all our projects as well. And I think that's sort of all I've got uh, in terms of the, um, the presentation. Uh, I think you're all probably I'll be bored by now, I'm ready for dinner. So um, yeah, I suppose I'll hand it back over to Oya. Yes, no one is bored, I'm quite sure. Very interesting and uh, very particular story that you have here. Thanks for sharing it. So there's one question that I can see in the chat here. And this, it says, it's from Nat. It says, thanks Ross for such an insightful backstory on your experience and process in developing the juggler. What was your biggest challenge entering the market is the first question. The second question is, and how did you overcome it? Yeah, our first challenge, I think, was um, uh, really um, sta staying sort of true to the original concept that we sort of started to think, you know, once we, once we sort of, uh, you know, decided to sort of do milk on tap, you know, we had a bit of an idea and really it was, it was a challenge to sort of balance the, the million different possibilities. What could a milk on tap system or rather what could a bulk milk dispenser be, you know? Um, and the, the sort of, so to come up, I suppose, to be thinking what could this be and constantly sort of map it against 
the real world, you know, we could have done so many different sort of uh, sort of things, but but ultimately, you know, a product is only as good as 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 it is, you know, being used in the real world. Um, and so that was a real that was a real challenge: time, money, um, energy, <laughs> all of those things too. They were they were pretty big challenges. Okay, next question uh, from Daniela. Thanks for sharing the story, Ross. I'm interested in the story behind the name Six Simple Machines. Is this something you can share? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, one of the, uh, I suppose, better um, experiences I had at uni was the um, class we had with Lance Brown, uh, Lance Green, sorry. Um, do business with a person called Lance Brown. Um, uh, Lance Green. Um, Lance Green uh, taught material science and so on. And I really enjoyed his um, lectures, uh, not so much for the stuff that he sort of put together as part of the curriculum, but his, his sort of anecdotal stuff. Uh, it was really boots on the ground, real sort of stuff uh, based on his experience in, in industry. When we uh, were looking for a uh, a name for the business. Um, you know, we were coming up with all these sort of different things and, and uh, we sort of started looking at our process. You know, at that stage, we'd already sort of started designing the juggler and, and, you know, there was this sort of feeling of sort of reduction. Yeah, we can solve a problem by adding more stuff, you know, whether it be complexity, components, whatever. But it was always like, well, let's, let's you know, let's go back to the start each time. What are we trying to solve for? Okay, we can't just sort of keep adding stuff. Let's take stuff away. So it was sort of this, this, this process where you're sort of building up to sort of go back to scratch all the time um, and back to first principle sort of thinking, I guess, with, with uh, a lot of it. Um, Adam suggested um, something that came from his course, which is this concept of the six simple machines. So to an artist, you've got you know, the primary colors um, and to an engineer, perhaps you have the six simple machines. So they're the, you know, the, the, the basic, the basic, um, uh, machines, I guess all complex machines are, are really can be seen as just a combination of these six simple machines, the, the wheel and axle, the incline plane, the, uh, um, you know, fulcrum, uh, screw thread and, and so on. So it was, it was really this idea of, of kind of first principle thinking, get to the heart of the, the problem you're trying to solve for without just adding, you know, <laughs> razzle dazzle and, uh, and, and complexity. Next question is from Eugene. He says, uh, awesome to see that coffee was written on your stars. And he also says, wasn't your graduation project a 3D printed coffee machine? <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. Yes, that was my, uh, my, my, my graduation project. Uh, it, it, started, it started the, uh, the process. <laughs> Uh, just a comment from Mike Durante. Congrats, mate. I hope you score some waves after the 180 days. Thank you very much, Mike. That would be yeah. nice as well. A question from Mar Mariano. Uh, Ross, have you ever considered entering the juggler into the Good Design Australia Awards? You should, you should. <laughs> um, no, uh, we haven't. Uh, we probably well, should. Uh, but I can't even, uh, you know, pay my phone bill on time. So can you imagine me trying to organize something like that? Well, yes, uh, I'll be on, on your back for that one. <laughs> a question from Min. I can't, uh, yes. Um, how did you cater for all the different milk to barista's preference? Did it take convincing into individual farmer? Yeah, good question, um, Min. Uh, we, the majority of milk companies now fill bags for the juggler, both uh, small independent dairies through to the biggest um, players here in Australia. Um, we've been stressed over the years about it sort of not really working out for you know individuals and then saying, oh, we're going to stop filling. So that would you know chain reaction, we'd be out of business pretty quick, or at least not producing the juggler in its current format pretty quick. Um, so that was a, an interesting sort of process that we went through. We worked really hard to create really good um, relationships with, with each company that we were working with and to Sort of the best of our ability to control it. We weren't selling very many machines early on. In fact, we sold five in the first year. Absolute disaster financially. Um, but we 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 sold, you know, maybe ten the next year, maybe twenty five in the year after, or whatever. You know, so it was it was still pretty grim, pretty early on. But 
with small sales, you know, we're able to work with smaller producers, make sure they were filling enough to make it worth their while. And then as we sold more machines and they sort of started to feel that, oh gosh, we're, you know, we're at capacity, we'd, we'd talk to other, other milk suppliers as well. So we'd have a customer that would say, oh, I want to use this particular milk and we'd, we'd approach the, uh, the business with them. And, and so it was quite a, a difficult time for us, both balancing the, the relationships we'd made and making sure we weren't taking business from uh, the dairy suppliers that have already started to support us, but mm -hmm. knowing that we needed to sort of bring on others and bigger um, at the same time. So we just spent, yeah, a lot of time talking to a lot of um, a lot of people, um, and ultimately it was our customers that sort of drove us to 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 the brands uh, that we work with. Um, yeah, I imagine now that you guys are so big, everyone probably wants to supply you some, you know, kind of milk, and then get their milk into the big, you know, big yeah. shots. But um, in the beginning, I imagine it would have been hard. Are you going to give some shout out to the Otto coffee machine? <laughs> sure. I work for Tiller now. I worked on a, um, a, a project, so the Otto coffee machine that you would have seen there earlier on. Um, uh, Craig Huron, a person that, that, you know, I've met and spent a um, good time. He's a great, great guy. Um, saw that as well. Uh, one time, I think he was a, a roof, roof plumber or something. Um, and he, he was sort of moved by it in a, in a similar way, but a different, different part. So he, um, he spent some time uh, re-imagining that, I suppose, with Tiller and Tiller um, and produced a stainless steel version of it, which yeah, is still, <laughs> still for sale today. So um, yeah, the uh, the atomic stroke Otto lives on. <laughs> great, great, great presentation. Thanks, Ross. You're welcome, in. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, you too. It's been a while. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Uh, Miles is asking: Hundred days, not giving up. What kept you and your close team going and not giving up? <laughs> Close team, Adam and I. Um, <laughs> there was a funny feeling, uh, I suppose, I don't know, I'm a, um, a particular type of person. I'm very uh, uh, sort of driven once I've found the thing that, 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 uh, that I'm into. Um, very flaky in a way with berries if I'm not particularly into something. Um, so this was something that I was particularly into. Um, and we just, we just, felt that, you know, he was a great sort of thing. It just took longer than we thought, you know, overall from design through certification, product testing to, to the sales of the first unit ultimately was about um, 18 months. So it wasn't even just those intense periods, you know, it just went on and on and on and on. And so I guess it was the belief that the product was good, um, balanced with a, a, you know, constant real world sort of check-in is it really good are we just you know we're kidding ourselves sort of here so it, it yeah I don't know it was it was um it was an intense period that I don't know if I've got the same energy for something um uh, again um yeah just it was a feeling that if we stopped we weren't just stopped but we were sliding backwards so it was can't stop <laughs> Another question now from Kim. Uh, wonderful story. We can understand the care you and the team put into getting a great product out there. How do you decide what and when to release a new version to the product? I'm um, sorry, I missed some of that. Um, so it's how do you decide what and when to release a new version to the product? Yeah, fair, fair call. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a product life cycle sort of stuff. Um, uh, you know, out there that sort of generally kind of sets some sort of, um, you know, metrics to follow on this. We don't do any of that sort of, uh, you know, proper business kind of analysis sort of stuff. We, we just feel that we are so in tune with, you know, what we're doing, our own capabilities. Um, the business is a business. It's a, it's a job. It's work and so on. But it's sort of like also this, this out of control hobby. <laughs> Um, and so there's this constant just want to do it better. So really there's some things that we're forced to change in the product, like, like certifications, compliance sort of regulations change. Um, for example, the gas in the refrigerators that we use, we 
have to change that for um, you know, various reasons that has a flow on through the product. So that's a forced change that industry has sort of said, here you go, you've got to change what you're doing. Um, but then other, other things is just, just this kind of innate desire, I suppose, that we have to, to make things better, to make things better for you know, every customer that spends their money with us, you know, whether they're a big customer or an individual customer, you know, we, we feel we owe them a, um, you know, a genuine sort of, um, you know, genuine effort to, to, to give them the best that we possibly can. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's not always um, a financial decision to change up the product or whatever. And in fact, often some of the changes we make probably aren't great financial sort of changes, but we feel that it's something we really want to want to do to the product and improve and, and again, put our best foot forward to for that customer who's who's giving us money, you know, and it's, um, it's a, there's no science, there's not a lot of science behind that decision. We just, we just, we just feel when it's right. So I'm conscious of the time, it's 7 p.m. already. So I'll go through two more questions. And the questions we haven't been able to answer, we will answer them in LinkedIn in the chat for the event. So let's try that. Two more questions. This one is interesting. Hi, Ross, thanks for sharing and congratulations on an amazing product. This is from uh, Martin Chung. Are you able to name any cafe using your system? It would be good to see it in action. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, literally hundreds, uh, literally, um, we've got about 1500 machines, um, around Australia. So there's a, a fair few. Um, if you want to uh, shoot me a note via LinkedIn, I'll, um, I'll, I'll send you a, a list where, where you are. And I'm, I'm sure I can send you a, um, a choice as well. <laughs> shoot, me a, shoot, shoot me a note, Martin. And the last question from Islam Air, uh, she says, there is a reaction against milk use and plant-based milk alternatives are preferred. How would this trend affect your business? Yeah, that's a, I mean, brilliant question. Um, again, um, you know, so we, uh, our, our machine, and we've done a lot of uh, testing with um, alternate milks, um, uh, you know, from oat to almond to macadamia to even hemp milk and, and so on. So. Um, a lot of that microbiological testing that we've, we've done and work with suppliers and so on to basically make sure that the uh, machine that we, we put out there can, um, uh, you know, cater and, and, and evolve for what the market needs. And if that's moving away from, from dairy milk, um, then, you know, we're ready for that. The question then comes down to, you know, packaging and logistics and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and at this point um, in Australia, we've got a few um, companies doing, you know, fruit juice, um, uh, almond milk, uh, and so on at volume uh, for our dispensers in, in the packaging. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's all to do with, with the, the um, actual sort of um, volume being used. And at this stage in Australia, dairy milk still outperforms uh, um, you know, um, non-dairy milks uh, individually, uh, perhaps not sort of uh, an aggregate, but individually. Um, and so our, the majority of our machines go out there still serving dairy milk. However, there are some out there uh, doing um, alternate milks, plant-based milks. Um, in the UK, our machines do um, a full cream milk and an oat milk. Uh, because that's what the um, uh, market over there, you know, they are, they've, they've decided, you know, oat milk's one over there. They're not choosing between, you know, eight different sort of alternate milks. They're oat or dairy uh, and, and, and the, the, um, the volumes are such that it warrants, you know, the bulk packaging um, and, you know, for us to sort of really understand the long-term effects that, that those different fluids, you know, they're chemically different, they're, you know, sediments are different, they perform differently in, in a whole host of, of different ways. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we, um, we just respond to, to, to how, the, how the world's moving. And I think the world's moving in a, in a pretty interesting sort of way at the moment. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, thank you so much, Rose. So I now want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our presenter, Ross Nichols for this fantastic story and for generously sharing his journey. So thank you, Ross.
Awesome. That was amazing. Thanks, Ross. Thank you for, uh, for, for enduring, enduring me. And thanks in return to, uh, you know, to you guys at uni and all the, all the people <laughs> that I studied with and continue to be in touch with. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Yes, thank you, Ross. And also to all our attendees this evening, thank you for joining us and making the evening even more special. But before you leave, there's something I'd like to, uh, to, to share with everyone. Yes, so do you see my slide? Mm -hmm. Yes, before you leave, I would like to mention the program for the talk series for next year, where we have six new talks planned. Suspense, suspense, I won't tell what they are, but this time we will also have smaller teams of designers from large companies like Breville, like uh, ResMed, teaming up to present the story of one product. So stay tuned for the invitations to these events. And we are all looking forward to seeing you again next year for the stories behind products. Until then, stay safe and well, and goodbye, everyone. And thanks, Ross, again. Thanks, Thanks, Ross. Thank Thanks. you all.